Coming up, Wes Studi's storied career in Hollywood. We visit with him. Plus, the chairman of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony tells us how he's working to protect sacred land from being destroyed. And what is it like to sit down with Leonard Peltier? That's the rare chance former North Dakota state lawmaker Ruth Buffalo had. She tells us about her visit. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. Amarawahopa. Thank you for joining us. We start our newscast in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where tribal leaders celebrated the passing of a new federal law to protect sacred objects. The Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony Act prohibits items to be exported and increases penalties for stealing native objects. Jeremy Filippi reports. <laughs> It's just really an honor to be here today to be able to celebrate changing the law in a way that will make our country better. This is about Congress listening to the voices and needs of the people we serve and making a difference. The STOP Act explicitly prohibits export of Native American cultural items and archaeological resources when United States law already prohibits these items from being trafficked domestically via NAGPRA and ARPA. We now have the legal means to address the unlawful trafficking of our cultural heritage. For a long time, we always honor where we come from, our, our, our deities, our, our, our Ajish and Navajo, that's what we call them. They're our sacred items and our elements to make sure that we take care of them because they weren't just created just to be created. Some of them are, have been here and they're a part of our communities and part of our nation. So anytime it leaves our nation, it's almost like uh, disrupting harmony. Thank you for making that stand to show all nations across the world that you honor and respect Navajo and Native people all across America. A pair of First Nations sisters are hoping to be exonerated after almost 30 years in Canada's prison system. Odelia and Nerissa Cusants have maintained their innocence ever since their 1993 second-degree murder conviction. Though one of their underage relatives admitted to and served time for the murder of a farmer, the sisters received life sentences. Odelia is now living in a halfway house while Nerissa is still incarcerated. In June of 2022, a letter from Justice Minister David Lametti stated the case would go under review, saying a miscarriage of justice likely occurred. The sisters are also among 12 Indigenous women that three senators are calling on to be exonerated. In an emailed statement, Justice Lametti says his decision on the sisters' case will be made on the basis of the facts and the law. Indigenous hockey players in Canada will soon have their legacy displayed on a trading card. The NHL's First Peoples rookie cards will feature eight Indigenous hockey players across multiple eras. This limited edition project is courtesy of the sports and trading card company Upper Deck. The company worked with the families of the hockey players and Indigenous creatives to make the set as authentic as possible. Upper Deck collaborated with Indigenous artists and even had the card backs written by a native card collector. In a statement, the company said the cards are meant to celebrate and preserve the history of Indigenous hockey players in Canada who had never before had a licensed NHL trading card. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast.
In 2021, former President Donald Trump approved a lithium mining project at Thacker Pass in northern Nevada. The site is the largest known lithium deposit in the U.S., which experts say is key to creating batteries for electric cars. Thacker Pass is a very sacred place to the tribal nations in the area, including the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. It is now the focus of a years-long legal battle between the lithium mine developer and the tribal nation. We have now the chairman of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, Arlen Melendez. Hello to you, chairman. Good uh, morning. Tell us about Thacker Pass's name in Paiute and about its cultural significance. Well, it's a Paiute uh, name, Pahima, and uh, it's significant to the uh, all the tribes up in uh, the region, probably throughout the whole state since tribes moved around and uh, we're, we have relatives up in uh, northern Nevada. And so uh, it's a real concern to us as far as the lithium mining that's going to happen. What kinds of boots on the ground organizing has been happening there in Nevada? Well, we had a march uh, last uh, week uh, to the federal building, the courthouse, because they're pending a decision on uh, on the uh, on the um, the mining issue there. And so uh, we're still waiting for that outcome, which will be decided within two months, hopefully. And uh, you know, it's uh, there were a lot of. Uh, uh, other tribes that joined us all the way from San Carlos and different uh, tribes throughout uh, the West. So we were very pleased with the turnout that uh, demonstrated a peaceful march down at the uh, federal building here in Reno, Nevada. Chairman, there have been reports alleging that no tribal consultation was done when this mining project was being proposed. When were you personally made aware of the, the project? Uh, it's been a, a couple of years. Uh, that uh, this was first uh, brought to uh, our attention. Uh, the, the challenge that we have is that uh, the Bureau of Land Management failed to notify uh, the tribes in the state of Nevada as to the largest lithium mine uh, in the nation. And the Reno Sparks Indian Colony contends that when you have a project that large, probably all of the tribes within a certain radius should be a contact and not just maybe the closest tribe and so that's the that, that's the reason we are litigating, because of lack of consultation without our input into it. I'm wondering if you can comment on how experts are saying that lithium is key to green energy, but at the same time you want to protect your sacred land. How do you sort of balance those two ideas? Well, I think that uh, because uh, the mine's proximity to reservations is. Uh, you know, the protection of our water, our animals, eagles, and, and plant life, and our way of life is, is important to us. It's unfortunate that uh, most of the, the mines end up being near reservations, you know, and uh, Nevada seems to be uh, more of a, a dumping ground, as you know, with the Yucca Mountain facility in eastern Nevada years ago, uh, and then the, this lithium mine uh, you know, tribes are going to have to stand up and not let them just come in and under the 1872 mining uh, law and just come in and, and just start mining without proper consultation. Uh, we may not be able to stop a mine based on that uh, mining uh, law, but we should be able to at least consult, have consultation with them and point out issues of mitigation. And, and that hasn't happened. So that's the reason we're uh, not real happy with the process. Chairman, I want to go back a few weeks ago to when oral arguments were heard in this case. How did you feel, um, you know, watching those oral arguments, and what were you taking away when you walked out of the, the courtroom that day? I think, uh, you know, there's a number of factors, or a number of groups that are litigating besides the tribes. There's environmentalists that are litigating. They seem to be, uh, in my opinion, it seems that the judge is listening more to the environmental groups than to the tribes. And so they may have uh, maybe uh, they have more standing uh, based on science or whatever it may be in the eyes of the judge. So uh, but it doesn't mean that we should uh, give up on this and and just let them do what they want to do, because it is affecting the tribes. We're the experts, you know, when it comes to uh, sacred sites. And as you know, the there was a massacre that happened out on that lithium site uh, in 1865, 
and you know the, the, the you know our ancestors uh, died there, and it's a sacred place to most of the tribes in the in the area. But uh, you know that wasn't even part of the record, as you might say, when uh, when B uh, the Bureau of Land Management basically uh, you know uh, uh, started to consult. So we uh, pointed that out, and they won't backtrack and include that in 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 this part of the lawsuit or anything so so unfortunately we're going to have to just uh, continue to see how this case goes chairman we're running out of time here but i do want to get your thoughts on what would happen if the judge ruled in favor of the mine um what would your tribal nation do in the event that that happened well we uh, we still have to fight the fight doesn't mean that uh you know the problem we had uh, is that the first time we uh we entered into this litigation. Shoni uh, narrowly led us in with certain uh, uh, certain aspects of what we were standing on. It, it, her position is that if we would have got in earlier, we could have had more uh, more uh, standing as to what we were saying. So our our contention, and not to see the tribe could litigate uh, further. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, appeal doesn't seem to be the answer because, you know, it's a, it, it would probably come out with the same decision if it comes out to be negative. So options are to continue to litigate and hopefully the second time around, they might let more evidence in that was left out the first time. So those are options that the tribe does have. So we're still uh, contemplating and working with some of the attorneys as the strategy and, and determining where we wanna go here. Well, Chairman Arlen Melendez from the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, thank you for telling us about your sacred site there in northern Nevada. Okay, thank you. It was the hit movie Dances with Wolves that first introduced audiences to Wes Studi. Since then, he's gone on to act in more than 80 films and many television shows. Patty Tholohongba recently sat down with the actor about his career and what's in store for him in 2023. From reservation dogs to spirit rangers, it seems like Wes Studi is everywhere these days. Welcome, Wes. You've played a wide range of characters over the last few decades. Do you have a favorite character? Absolutely not. I do not have a favorite character. I always like to say that my favorite character is the next one I'm going to do. But what a wide, wide range of characters. And, um, you know, looking from the uh, 90s until now, uh, what is it like to play, you know, to be one of the elders on the set of Reservation Dogs? Makes me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for sure, right? But um, in terms of like helping to um, mentor that next generation, do you see a lot of that happening on set? No, actually, it's very exciting to work with young people who are uh, just starting out in the business and they're uh, very excited about it all, you know, uh, and uh, it kind of rejuvenates my excitement for the whole thing, uh, you know, after having been in the business for 35, 40 years or whatever it has been. Um, yeah, uh, I think I really appreciate uh, the uh, amount of uh, enthusiasm and uh, excitement that young people bring to the business. And uh, I think uh, really moving it along at a fast pace at this point. You've played warriors, you've played relatives, you've played all kinds of uh, roles. Um, and recently you had a role as a love interest. Uh, tell us a little bit about a love story. Well, yeah, it was my first time having that kind of a role. And uh, so, yeah, I, I jumped on it. You know, I, it, it took me 40 years to get a screen kiss, right? But, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, all been uh, uh, a huge learning arc, and I continue to learn uh, on a picture-to-picture uh, -picture basis. And I hope to be doing uh, many more of those. Uh, uh, we have uh, things lined up for this coming year, wherein perhaps I will play two people, you know, uh, one of those uh, 
things where you have you're like playing uh, two characters. Uh, so um, I can't go into that yet because it's nowhere near the uh, photography stage. So uh, we've uh, got a number of things planned as well as we have uh, pictures that have already been shot that will be uh, coming out. Uh, um, um, can't think of them right now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it sounds like you've got a lot of irons in the, in the fire here, a lot of projects going on. We have a lot of things going on this coming year, yes. Um, um, uh, one being, uh, uh, we'll continue to do reservation dogs, of course, and uh, hopefully they'll write me in as a, as a, a more uh, stable uncle, uh, a part of uh, the whole show, but uh, we'll see what happens with that, as well as uh, I continue to do uh, um, the uh, Spirit Rangers, which is one of the more uh, fun things to do uh, 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 in playing uh, the voice of the sun itself, you know. Uh, but uh, we have that as well as uh, uh, other films that have already been done that are in post now that will be uh, coming out uh, as uh, time goes by. But we'll continue to shoot and uh, uh, Life is looking up. And you won an award recently for voiceover work. Right, I did. And that was that was very gratifying, to tell the truth. And I hope a lot of it had to do with having done a number of animated features as well as uh, television programs. And uh, um, uh, the Voice Actors uh, Society gave me what is called the, uh, the Muhammad Ali uh, humanitarian voice uh, award and it's uh, a replica of uh, Ali's uh, face one that uh, the only one that he ever approved uh, in his lifetime and uh, was quite the uh, quite the award I I, uh, I I felt honored humbled by uh, the fact that uh, the voice actors uh, uh, decided to give me that and uh, um, continue to try to honor it. In addition to the voice or work you've done for films and video, you're also now voicing Vine Deloria's book, God is Red. Um, had you read that before? Were parts that really resonated with you? What was that experience like? Well, you know, we, we the old movement back in the 70s used a lot of his uh, thinking, his, uh, his the way that he came about in making points in terms of the movement that was existing at that time. So yeah, I had read it, but mainly cherry picked the things that he had said that were used uh, in terms of promoting the movement back then. But at, <clears throat> upon reading it for Audible, for uh, uh, that uh, voiced, uh, uh, you know, I learned a lot more about the way that uh, he, his theology, thinking about theology, the idea of how we all relate to the earth. We had also done a, a book before that called The Way We Used to Live, which was one of his, I think, later, later books, uh, while uh, God is Red was uh, from back in the late 60s, 70s. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's it's a damn good book. I, it's uh, a lot of uh, thought put into that. He he was quite the thinker, the man. Well, Wes Duty, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, we'll follow you through twenty twenty three and catch up with you again. See you again.
Leonard Peltier has been described by some as America's longest political prisoner and has served more than 46 years in a federal maximum security prison. The indigenous activist was convicted of first-degree murder in the deaths of two FBI agents in the 1970s. In recent years, there have been renewed calls for his clemency, an action that can be done by President Joe Biden. Joining us today is former North Dakota State Representative Ruth Buffalo, who recently had the very rare chance of visiting with Peltier. Hi there, Ruth. Ruth, thanks for being here. Hi, Dosha. Um, good agu taste of kids. Thank you for having me. Tell us about your trip to Florida. Um, it was a, a really good trip. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect, but I, I'm really thankful that I had uh, three days to visit with our relative and elder, um, native elder Leonard Peltier. How did a trip like this happen? Had you been communicating with him beforehand? Yeah, um, I believe about a year ago, we started communicating through phone conversations. Um, and then um, he sent a letter on my birthday and had an application in there to apply to become, uh, to, to get on his visitors list. Um, but that was during the uh, campaign season. And so I wasn't able to uh, fill out the forms and everything until end of November. And when you actually saw him, um, what stood out to you most in those kinds of conversations? Uh, without getting too emotional, because it, it really uh, tugs at the heartstrings for me, and I think for a lot of people, but just seeing a very, um, very elderly man who looked like a relative of, of many of ours, uh, but just seeing him in there, um, in that setting to begin with was really hard to... Um, hard not to get overwhelmed or uh, overcome with a lot of uh, emotions just, you know, from the the time you go in, you know, they you wait in different areas um, and being in there with other uh, individuals who are, are going to, to visit their, their loved ones was really, um, it just was a lot of uh, powerful emotions. Um, we had heard um, for several years now that the state of his health is something that a lot of supporters had been concerned about. And you just mentioned that he um, was very elderly appearing. Um, what could you kind of say about how he was doing uh, physically? Um, again, he's, you know, he's 78 years old. Um, he has a number of health, serious health conditions. Um, and so he... Um, yeah, I, I just, I kind of hesitate on how much to share and, and what to share, what not to share. But, um, you know, when we were parting ways, he did uh, lose his balance a couple times. Um, and so he is, his spirit is, you know, strong in my eyes, you know, but he is very um, frustrated with um, with still being in there. And so he needs to, to come back to North Dakota, here in North Dakota, and be with his loved ones, his relatives. Um, but yet he, he does have some serious health conditions that need attention. Um, he is now um, has a cell mate, which he has shared uh, very deep concerns over. Um, they do go in lockdown randomly, and he just came off of a five-day lockdown recently. Um, and so the, they go into lockdown without um, notice and, and they're confined to their their small cells um, and now he is sharing his cell very small cell with the cellmate. Ruth I, I read an interview that you did recently and you said that there was parts of your conversations that you wanted to keep private and I want to respect that but I think that this is the perfect avenue for native people listening to this conversation to kind of learn more so I'd like to ask you again what you do feel comfortable sharing in terms of conversation topics. Yes, um, during those three days, we, you know, I was there for New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, and January 2nd, um, and so we talked a lot, you know, it was just kind of visiting back and forth um, as, as relatives, you know, talking about stories growing up in North Dakota, um, you know, his time spent in Wapatin Indian Boarding School, which is an hour south of here in Fargo, um, a lot of similarities and a lot of overlaps and a lot of a common theme of justice and, and standing up for justice and continuing to push for justice, um, not just for natives, but also for all people. Um, and so it's very important that we continue to push for his release. Um, he still stands by his innocence and 
you know, I stand by our relative native elder, Leonard Peltier. He needs to be free. More needs to be done in looking at his case. Uh, we know this has been going on for decades. This as in injustice, this as in bias within the criminal justice system. Um, he had mentioned also, so I just learned so much from him. Um, he has so much knowledge and, you know, he, he shared um, also that as Native people, we are the only group of people that is not afforded a jury of peers. Um, so a lot of what he is going through, many of our relatives face in every level of government, whether it's a state prison, county jail, uh, federal prison, and, and we know that we are overrepresented in every level of government in the criminal justice system. Um, so lots to unpack there, but so much more work that needs to be done so that our relatives can live a good life like everyone else. Well, Ruth Buffalo, thank you for sharing more about your in-person visit with Leonard Peltier. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. The Sand Creek Massacre, the betrayal that changed Cheyenne and Arapaho people forever, focuses on tribal accounts of Colorado's deadliest day. Exhibition details at HistoryColoradoCenter.org. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.